Well, hey, CT at Home family, I am so glad that you have chosen to gather together today. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation that we're gonna have with Toby as we're in the middle of this Again series. And we're talking about how it's hard to do really anything, but it's especially hard to have to do something again. And today uh, is a message close to my heart. Uh, it's about what it looks like for us to choose to hope again. Let's jump in. So today, as we continue this conversation that we're calling again, if you haven't been able to join with us, we've simply been saying that the hardest thing in life is the thing that we have to do again, and yet it's in the again that we find God. Today, I want to talk about the one thing you and I can't live without. What's the one thing you and I can't live without, and yet it's the one thing that Many times we find ourselves losing over and over and over again. It's one of my favorite stories in the life of Jesus. It's found in the fourth gospel. There's Matthew's account of Jesus' life, Mark's account, Luke's account, and then there's John. John's kind of the peace, love, hippie of the group. He's the one who's all into emotion and feeling. And in the fifth chapter of his story of the life of Jesus, we find ourselves at the pool of Bethesda. Now, I've gotten to go to the pool of Bethesda. It is one of the coolest places in all of Jerusalem for me personally. It's this huge outdoor pool. And when I say outdoor pool, don't think Olympic size. Think Olympic on steroids size because it's, it's not only just a huge area, but there's, there's little canals that run to all these different places. And this is where the sick people of the city would go. It was kind of a Jesus Day uh, hospital. It, people would go and that's uh, where they would hang out. Why? Because they believed that an angel might come and stir the water and they would get healed. And one day Jesus is walking through the marketplace. Uh, most self-respecting Jews would turn their back toward the uncleanness of this water area full of sick people. But Jesus walked right into the middle of it, and he walked up to a guy, and he asked him the craziest question. He said, hey, do you want to get well? Now, if you didn't know it was Jesus speaking, and you were reading the story for the first time, you probably would think what I would think was, what a dumb question. This guy has been laying here for all of these years. Jesus walks up and says, do you want to get well? And he, the the guy says back to Jesus, you can read it, John chapter 5, he says, Sir, I've been sitting here all of this time, and I don't have anybody to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And he said, and I'm trying to get in, but every time I try to get in, somebody goes down in front of me. And the end of the story is that Jesus heals this man, Jesus touches this man, but it's not a story about simply Jesus healing, Jesus is teaching you and I something about hoping. Because today I would say that of all of the things that we might list, we have to have air, we have to have food, we have to have water. What is it? The seven needs, you know, the, I remember the pyramid. That I would say that one of the things beyond physically that we need more than anything else is we need hope. I don't know if there's a more poignant moment in the history of the world in my 58 years uh, than this point in time to say that we are a nation and we are living in a world that is quickly losing hope. At the time of this recording, uh, what many of us thought in America was over seems to be rising again. There's uncertainty. You go into the grocery store or any public place, and you can almost see, uh, feel the tension beginning to rise because people are hoping upon hope that we don't find ourselves in a worse situation than we have in the pandemic over the last couple of years. And I think, I know Jesus in his day and in this day understands the battle that we have with hope. So let's break down this little story a little bit for you and I today. And I, I don't want to rush to the end where Jesus heals the man. That's where most church people go. It's like, let's get to the good part. I want you to put yourself literally 
on this mat of this man who has been laying at the pool of Bethesda. I want you to think about him for 38 years being surrounded by people just like him. Now, when I say people just like him, I'm talking about people who are seen by society as people who must have done something bad because God is punishing them for being disabled. I'm talking about people surrounded by people who, uh, who weren't accepted anywhere they went, people who were out religiously, economically, uh, socially, in every form and fashion. They were the outsiders. This is where he's been not for 38 hours, not for 38 minutes, not for 38 months, but he's been there for 38 years. And I'm wondering when the day came. I'm sure it wasn't day one, whoever his friend, his family was that set him down by the pool. I'm sure day one, he woke up believing that that was going to be his day. That that would be the day that the waters would be stirred. He would get into the water, be miraculously healed, and not simply be able to walk again, but to be accepted again. We don't know much about this man's faith. He's living in a Jewish culture, in a Jewish uh, city, I'm sure uh, that he was at some level of a devout Jew, which one of the things you're taught from a very early age, that if you pray right, hold your mouth right, do more good things than bad things, God is going to answer your prayers. Because sometimes the more things stay, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And so I'm sure that first day he was believing that it was going to be his day. I probably would guess in the first week he was believing that it was going to be his day. What? How long did it take before he began to see his situation as permanent? How long did it take before he began to believe that God was distant? As I like to say, how long did it take for him to start believing that there was something wrong with him or something wrong with God because his prayers weren't being answered. I don't know about you, but I could spend a lot more time than we have today talking to you about prayers that haven't been answered in my life. I can uh, tell you about a 27 year battle with anxiety and panic that I began believing that God was going to supernaturally lift it off of me. I can tell you about the day uh, when I lost hope and believed that I would be better off to my family, to my friends, to leave this earth than to continue to live with this condition. It wasn't simply a panic disorder. It was the loss of hope and believing that there was something wrong with me or there was something wrong with God because nothing was changing. And one of the things that encourages me in this account of John's of the life of Jesus is that Jesus waited right into the middle of that mess. That Jesus doesn't see what others see. Jesus has this incredible propensity to, uh, to see not what is, but what can be. And I'm going to say to you today, as you, uh, as you think about the moment that you lost hope, I want you to know that Jesus sees you, Jesus knows you, and Jesus hears you. Uh, I brought a little uh, illustration, I think, of what happens to us many times that as we begin hopeful and we end up hopeless. Uh, now, these things, they tell me they're, they're about 35 pounds a piece. Uh, I'm assuming they mean each piece of this weighted bag here. So basically, I'm one of the strongest men on the planet. And I think what happens is, is this illustrates the fact that at some point, you believe, you begin to hope, you begin to wish, you begin to dream, and you're able to carry that. But along the way, uh, as the days and the weeks pass and your prayers don't get answered and life doesn't go the way 
that you wanted to go and what you believe about that happened in the Bible isn't happening to you, you get tired. Uh, you get weary. Your arms get sore. And over a period of time, you carry that long enough and you finally decide it's better to put it down. The problem isn't simply that you're losing hope. The problem for most of us is we come to the place where we're scared to hope again. That's why Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? Uh, Are you willing to believe again in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he might do a work in you that's beyond what you could even begin to imagine? See, The secret to hoping again when what you've hoped for the longest hasn't happened is to shift your focus from hoping for something to hoping in someone. I love uh, Romans 5, 5. I always like verses that I've heard before and it took me so long to believe that that verse was true. There's a little verse in Romans chapter 5 that says, There is a hope that does not disappoint. And I thought, well, that's not true. I've hoped for lots of things, and I've been disappointed in the past. But when you begin to read that verse in the context of what the writer of Romans is building a case for in Romans 5, what he's saying is this, is that hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is confident expectation in someone. You know how I got my hope back? Uh, I didn't get my hope back because... One day, uh, I finally got it right, and I had this supernatural lifting of an anxiety and panic disorder off of my life. Here I am 28 years later, I still battle that from time to time. When my hope began to come back is when I began to believe that God was good and wanted to bring good into my life. Then when I began to stop putting expectations on a God of grace and mercy that loves me unconditionally, I was free to hope again. I was free to believe again. I was free to ask God for anything because whether his answer was yes or his answer was no, in all things, God was working to bring about good in my life. And I'll never forget the day that I feel like Jesus walked into my life and asked me, do you want to get well? And it was in a a moment of quiet desperation where what I was sensing God saying to me in that moment without, without going into unbelievable detail was I was believing that God was saying to me, are you willing to trust me again? Are you willing to believe in my goodness that I can bring good out of any situation in your life. Are you willing to let go of the conditions you put on fully giving yourself to me?
Well, you don't have to be in the roughest season of your life to find yourself needing to hope again. I mean, look at the world around us. Look at the things that are happening. I know it doesn't matter what the headline is. I constantly think, is th are things gonna get better? Can this really be better again? Is it really worth hoping again in a God who has said all these things to us? And so I pray that you received hope today. I pray that you receive the encouragement and the faith that you need to hope again, to hope again for your personal situation, to hope again in what's going on in your family to believe that God can show up again. Maybe it didn't work out the first time and you're thinking it surely can't happen again the second time. I pray that you would be encouraged to believe and have all the faith you need in a God who loves you, who hears you, and who knows you. See, I'm, I love this. Like I love that we get to choose to be together. We get to choose to receive hope together. And I want to encourage you. This message needs to be heard by someone else. I want to encourage you to give hope to someone, to share this message with someone, to continue to do what you guys are doing by a asking and allowing and opening up your doors for more people to come into your CT at home families. For those of you making those financial gifts, thank you for continuing to give hope that way. We get to expand God's kingdom because of what we're choosing to do as a church family. When we choose to make these sacrifices, when we choose to say, I'm willing to do that again, we get to step out, we get to open our arms wider, we get to point more people to the love and the grace of who Jesus is. So thank you. Thank you for being part of our CT at Home family. Thank you for being part of the bigger family here at Cross Timbers Church. I love you. I hope you have an incredible week. We will see you next week as we wrap up this again series.